Today, we review Hitman Absolution for the PS3. We also review Halo 4. Then we made a stop by Straight Games to check out their Wii U lineup. In the lobby, we revisit Warfighter, plus some Dead or Alive 5. What can I say? Today is a great day to be a gamer. You've just entered the lab. Hitman Absolution. We played this one for the PS3. And guess what? You crank this up to the purest level and it's good times. Okay, the best way to start this review would be to say Hitman Absolution was a breath of fresh air. For me at least. I haven't played a game like this in a while and it's safe to say I appreciated the change of pace. Absolution follows the story of hired assassin Agent 47. Now 47 is sent on a mission to take out rogue agent Diana Penelope Burnwood, his former handler who brought down the agency single-handedly. The agency now back on his feet is out for revenge and 47 is chosen as the man for the job. However, 47 realizes things aren't exactly the way they seem and turns on the agency while protecting the life of this one very important girl. Thank you for your help. This girl is important. Take this. Who everyone else seems to be after. This girl is apparently some kind of perfect weapon. She is beyond perfect. I knew there was some reason the agency wanted her so bad. Jackpot! The story of Absolution plays out well, with the usual twists and turns, double crosses and entertaining enemy types expected in the world of assassins and criminal masterminds. <clears throat> you really want to know? Because I can help you find them. For a price, of course. The voice acting helps solidify this good story. Very convincing dialogue delivered by A-list standard actors. We're talking about the likes of Vivica A. Fox, among others. 47, this is Benjamin Travis. The money has been wired to your account. Welcome to Chicago. What also helps propel the story and overall feel of the game are the visuals. The graphics in Absolution are really well done, from the various character models to the amazing environments to the beautiful cutscenes. They all blend in seamlessly to further immerse you in this memorable gameplay experience. Now you better keep those. What the? Not gonna shoot! Just release them! The controls are another thing that are seamlessly integrated. In a game like this, where you rely solely on stealth as your primary means to dispatch the opposition, you need smooth controls. Controls that say, yes, the developers had the player in mind. Controls that say developers were not foolish enough to try and integrate complex controls as a part of the difficulty level. Games like Hitman Absolution and the Uncharted series will always receive high praises from me where this is concerned. Developers take note. Gameplay controls should not, I repeat, should not be a part of the game's challenge. Think of video game controls as you would an automobile's controls. You hop into a car, you like to start it up and enjoy the ride, right? Not battle with how to control it. That's my point. And in Hitman Absolution, while the controls aren't 100% perfect, I see where devs had the player in mind. We get to spend less time trying to figure out the controls and more time enjoying what the game has to offer. Remember, this isn't a hack and slash game. A game like this requires precision. Stealth requires very refined controls. Maybe the guys responsible for Tenshu Stealth Assassins should take that into consideration before releasing another in the series, if they ever do. The scores, another element that helps get you completely lost in the experience. You know, when you think about it, or maybe I speak for myself, but the purpose of playing video games is to escape reality for a bit, get immersed in a virtual world. And with scores like these, well, let's say it gets the job done. Let's move more to gameplay. As you progress through the stages, you unlock new abilities. Not in a deep, meaningful role-playing kind of way, but you do. While going through, I must admit though, I didn't really see a great difference with the various unlocks, but they were there and I'm not complaining. Good luck, Holmes. Like I said regarding the controls, the stealth element is the key part of the game. I've heard reviewers say, you have a choice, you can either proceed through a level stealthily or you can try a run and gun. But to me, that's no option really. Oh, yeah. 
You try to move your way through a stage and there's a 99.9% .9 chance of failure. Hey, stop right now. I am serious. So yes, the stealth element is what it's all about and it's done well here as there's so many ways of silently dispatching the enemy. So many and so very entertaining. They're not all very practical but they do work well. Once you're able to understand what works well, where and when. When it comes to shock and arc, like I said, it doesn't work most of the times but if you're in a tight spot where you're detected, you can give it a shot as Hitman Absolution isn't the kind of game where you end up shooting a guy 10 times and he keeps coming. Mostly one shot kills here and the cover system works pretty well. So even though it's not advised, shock and awe can help you out in a pickle. The quick time melee events are a bit of a paper scissors rock kind of thing and can get a bit annoying and clumsy at times. But with some practice, you'll kind of get used to the routine. Now, let me get something straight. Something I should have pointed out before. This review is based on the purest difficulty setting. The hardest setting. Where you get no hints, the enemy will detect you at the drop of a pin and the AI is way up there. Now, you're given several options for difficulty levels to choose from. And I was a bit intimidated at first when starting it up, but I still went straight to purest and I'm glad I did. I've seen videos of this game on lower settings where there's lots going on in your HUD with indicators showing you safe distances and so on, but in my opinion, playing this game by those rules slightly defeats the purpose and seriously dilutes the experience. Chloe? Yeah, Chloe, okay, stay calm. There's, there's a bunch of bodies where I am right now. I, we don't have the infrastructure to deal with this. I mean, yeah. You're gonna have to call up state, tell them to send everything they got. With that said, the enemy AI, while they could be smarter, they're smart enough. They're not as random and witty as other enemy types in games like Halo, but they put up a good enough challenge. So, I'm good with that. Hitman Absolution gives us the opportunity to use disguises. Now while this is a cool addition, it's terribly flawed. It actually leaves me wondering if it was an afterthought. If the devs came up with this last minute and decided, hey, let's throw this in. Now, here's how it works. You can take someone out and take whatever it is they're wearing. Of course, if you see a bag of clothes on the ground somewhere, you can steal that as well. But here's the problem. Whatever it is that you're wearing is only detectable by others wearing the same clothes. So think about it. You enter a police station. You'd like to blend in. What would you logically do to blend in in such an environment? You'd want to dress like a cop so you appear to be one of them. But once you get within four feet of another cop, he points you out as being a fake. Oh hey, you must be the new guy. Come on, are you kidding me? You think I'm gonna fall for that? Are you not listening to me? Same thing goes for any other disguise you put on. Even if it covers your face. Yeah. Got my eye on you. Now I get what you're trying to say, that for most part, other persons on the same team as you could realize they've never seen you before. But it's way too sensitive. And even if you took the disguise of a chef in a crowded area in Chinatown, other chefs will pick you out as a fake and you don't even work with them. So how the hell do they know if you're a fake or not? Something's off with this guy. I'm just saying, cool addition, but requires some refinement. Every single copper security guard in a city can't know each other. I mean, come on. It's for you. Skirky here, why? I like how random the duration of each stage is. It helps with the immersion process. The hard, harder, hardest, long, longer, longest thing in most games is what sometimes sets in that tedium effect. It reminds you that you're playing a video game and I don't want that. I want an experience that's closer to real life, where anything can happen. Now just because I'm halfway through the game doesn't mean I can't meet up on a short or easy stage. I call that balance. I know I'm probably alone on this, but one of my favorite things is to reach the end of a game and meet up on a boss that's a pushover or no boss at all. Now the checkpoint system like in most games also works similarly. Only thing is sometimes you mess up and end up way back. I think this happens more often than I would like because I'm playing on the purest level. So things like instincts, which is an element of the game that helps you go undetected or detect solutions, helps you through without too many retries, if you're real perceptive. 
Your powers of perception can go a long way to completing this game in a reasonable time. A lot of things in this game aren't as obvious as you'd like them to be, so you know you have to pay close attention. Again, I'm reviewing this game on the hardest difficulty, so maybe if you dumb it down to one of the noob levels, you should be able to walk through it pretty easily, but on purist, well, they might as well call it Hitman Trial and Error. We've created contracts, a mode where everybody can take part in these challenges and even create them inside Absolution. The multiplayer. I like what the devs did with this. It's not your regular team deathmatch capture the flag routine. Instead, you play contracts. Contracts created by other players. To be honest with you though, I don't have much interest in playing these contracts, but I'm sure others do and it's good to have the option. And I don't think the traditional multiplayer needs to be tossed into every game. Some games just don't need it. And it's best to not have multiplayer at all than to create a bad multiplayer component. Yes, sir. So far, so good. Most things got a thumbs up for me, but here are a few places Square Enix could have stepped it up. We have no vault controls. You can't vault over a low wall or table if you want to. You have to walk around it. Now, this might seem trivial, but think about it. You've been detected, you're on the run, you meet upon an obstacle, a very low obstacle. You'd like to, in the heat of this chase, just jump over it and move to safety, but no. Look, I know this isn't sleeping dogs, but come on. Absolution in all its glory also has its fair share of glitches. Some seem to come from how linear the game gets at times. It's like if you don't play the game the way the devs intended you to play it, you suffer. Like trying to run to a door without eliminating certain guards first. You end up standing at the door waiting for the icon to appear that tells you you can proceed, but it doesn't pop up. While if you play the level again and take out the specific guards, the icon is there. Now that's either a glitch or the devs making the game way too linear. Either is a problem. Would dare f with me? Are you kidding me? You have no customizable loadouts. You know, instead of resetting your arsenal after a stage, it would be really cool if you could take, let's say, the sniper rifle you found in the previous stage into the next. Because even though this game is a stealth game, sniper rifles are very few and far in between. Trust me, in situations like the ones you're presented with in Absolution, a sniper rifle could really save you a lot of time and trouble. Yes. So anyway, that's about it. Hitman Absolution, a great game in my books. One I almost missed out on simply because I was never really a fan of the series, but one I'm glad I picked up. You should do the same. Visit Straight Games in the Sovereign Center. New or used, it's your choice. The lab gives Hitman Absolution an 8 out of 10. After the break, we talked to Gregor from Straight Games on his Wii U lineup, plus a review of Halo 4. You know, Straight Games and the Sovereign Center has pretty much everything you'll ever need where video games are concerned. But today we talked the Wii U. Now here's what Gregor had to say. Hi, this is Gregory from Straight Games in the Sovereign Center and first of all let me just say a happy new year to all the fans of the lab out there you know thanks for the support thanks for the support that Straight Games has been receiving but let's get down to business we're here to talk about the latest system from Nintendo which is called the Wii U now the Wii U is a true successor to the previous console which was just the Wii I mean that console to me I consider it um, you know the most successful console of the last generation simply because it's still trumping ps3 and xbox 360 sales by say about 300 million units the greatest selling point or the greatest accessory that it comes with is the control pad now this thing has a, a, a six inch lcd screen built into it um, it has the ability to control your television and your cable box you know you have head headphone inputs in there and it has a rechargeable battery built in you know it has two analog sticks 
two triggers you know your standard um, d-pad and also the screen itself is a touch screen it has a camera and a microphone so you can use Skype software with it you know you can um, talk to people message people from from directly from the pad now the beauty about the console itself is that you'll be able to play your games without using the television you know if somebody wants to use the television and you're playing say a Mario and you know somebody turns off the television or change the channel you can actually continue just looking on the screen and play a game now that's pretty good especially if you want to tweak the settings of the system you know you want to um, maybe you know change your wireless settings you want to change your display settings that kind of thing you don't need to turn on your television take up the controller press the power button and everything is there on the screen in front of you now <clears throat> I've played a couple of titles that um, came out with the Wii U um, I've played FIFA 13, that game is great, you know, you can use both screens. Um, and also Black Ops 2. Now the beauty about Black Ops 2, if you're doing a local multiplayer session, you can act the person who is in control of the control pad, they can actually stay and play the game. They have the control pad and the game is being played on the screen. Now player two is actually using the television, so it's it operates totally independent of each other. So you can have a proper multiplayer setting without no one looking on your screen and you know, see what you're doing. Now the Wii U, well first and foremost the Wii itself, that's the older console, many persons thought that it was a little too gimmicky or for the younger kids but now the Wii actually will appeal to both hardcore gamers and casual gamers so you'll still have the the motion version games, it still can play your old Wii games as well but you have games like Assassin's Creed, Creed 3, you have Batman and Arkham City, you have Mass Effect 3, you have Call of Duty Black Ops 2 and you have a lot more hardcore titles slated to be released on the Wii U. Straight games will have them, we have some titles already and as soon as the new ones come out we'll have them in stock so you can just come on down, we'll be glad to give you a demonstration of the Wii U system. We have the system in stock and we have accessories as well. So it's a, it's a fabulous console in my opinion and I believe it's a true contender for the next generation of consoles. Come on down to Straight Games, come take a look at what we have. We have the Wii U in stock, we have the accessories and the games for it. Um, you can like us on Facebook, it's www.facebook.com slash straight games. You know, you can see all the things, the new things that we're getting in. You know, we're in the Sovereign Center, downstairs shop 21. So, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing you and thank you for the continued support. Halo 4. Now, did new developers 343 Industries do a good job of carrying on the Halo name? Well, let's find out. Now, while I'm not the community's biggest Halo fan and I haven't played all the games in the franchise's history, I have been with Halo from its inception. Yes, I still own a copy of Halo Combat Evolved. Played it all the way through, played Halo 2 and made sure to complete Halo 3 before I took up Halo 4 for this review. So on to Halo 4. The Master Chief is dead. We return to a world of shooting bugs who have at their disposal force fields and ray guns. Guns that for most part do very little damage to their targets when you're using them. The same thing goes for your weapons manufactured here on Earth. I'm sorry, I know I sound biased, but I'll never be able to process the logics of games like these. We're in like the year 2557, so far ahead in the future. Now history dictates that mankind and pretty much all living creatures, if we haven't perfected anything or gotten anything else right, we've gotten the art of war down to a bloody science. Yes, with all our imperfections, all our shortcomings, the one thing we focus on and do well is fight. So, with that said, I ask the question, why so far into the future, where we're still at war with each other and other species, we have the technology to teleport, to fly, build relationships with computers, but we still can't create guns that work? You already know everything. Now the Halo universe is filled with guns, lots of guns, some even look like Christmas tree decorations, but most serve very little purpose, or have to be used in a specific way on a specific enemy type. 
Yes, I usually start my reviews off on a high note, but this is just inexcusable, ridiculous crap that I'll never let slide. Earth and its forces have been fighting the Covenant and the Flood and whatever else for years, but we're not smart enough to spend a little extra time creating guns that work. Seriously, Master Chief, Cortana, and the whole lot of them would be surprised how many decades ago this battle could have ended, how many lives could have been saved, if we all just took the time to create better artillery. She said that to me once. Okay, I've gotten that off my chest. Now let's move on. There's a new villain, a new thorn in the side of Earth and its inhabitants. A new race has reared its ugly head, the Prometheans, with this boss called the Didact. Humanity's imprisonment is a kindness. Who's after something called the Composer, which he'll use to destroy the Earth and rule the universe, yada yada, whatever. Your compassion for mankind is misplaced. No, it's a fine story if you're into sci-fi and particularly Halo's brand of sci-fi. Me? I didn't really feel the story or its execution. No, not because I'm not a Halo fan, but really because, although I find it kind of ridiculous how many different alien species are out there with the destruction of Earth and everything else on their minds, this pseudo-love story between Master Chief and his AI Cortana seems really empty to me. I can understand that if you're like Master Chief, a man with no friends and no life beyond saving everyone else's, then I get why this computer program will be so important to you. Because soldier or not, a man can get lonely. We all saw that move with Tom Hanks on the football on the island. So yeah, I get that. I get it. But I did not feel it. And to base most of the game on John, aka Master Chief, rushing to find a cure for Cortana, who's apparently suffering from some kind of virtual Parkinson disease, and Cortana trying to find answers for Master Chief's cold and somewhat machine-like disposition just didn't grab me. At some point, it felt like the meat of the matter, saving the planet Earth, took a backseat to their relationship drama. She said that to me once. Now, the graphics. Two thumbs up to new developers, 343 Industries. A great way to end a 360's nearly decade-long lifespan. Go out with a bang, so to speak. The fact that I play this game back to back with Halo 3 helped me solidify this claim. Now I know there have been others in the franchise, but Halo 4 follows up the story of Halo 3 immediately, so I couldn't help but notice that contrast. Wake up, Chief. I need you. The graphics are great all around, but the detail in the faces in the cutscenes were exceptionally impressive. Our destiny as a species. Do not underestimate them, but most of all, do not underestimate him. Voice acting, spot on with the graphics, a real top-notch A-list material. Now, the enemy AI is brutal to a fault. I really can't recall AI this formidable in any game I've played. In some games, the enemy seems really hard simply because they're relentless and they come at you in great numbers. But in Halo, even if you're up against just one opponent, you'll see that they're not just working off strength in numbers, these guys are clever. Again, I don't know what they're like on the easier difficulties, but on Legendary, brutal is the best way to describe the AI. Unfortunately, and as usual, your squad has absolutely no intelligence whatsoever. Look, devs, I don't know if any of you are listening, but if you are, take note. Dumb squad AI should not be a factor when designing a game's difficulty level. It's okay to have a squad that actually efficiently eliminates the enemy. It doesn't take the difficulty level down, it increases production value. Can you guys process that? Yes, I read you. Always love the checkpoints in a Halo game. Since combat evolved till this day, 90% of the time, you'll get a checkpoint when you really need it. This is important for a player like myself. I hate doing things over, so if I must, don't put me back too far. How do we get over there? Can barely. End of the ramp. Repetition. I didn't expect this from a franchise as large as Halo. I expected more creativity where level design was concerned. Design the objectives in each level with a bit more thought. Because here's the thing, I don't love Halo, but I love video games in general, enough to give any title a shot, and Halo, love it or not, is supposed to be a pretty good game. But I found myself bored with the same old, same old in every stage. There are three or four switches, or reactors, or pylons, or some other crazy crap that needs to be put back online or repaired. Now, if memory serves me correctly, this happened in just about every stage. Again, this is way into the distant future. You're telling me that Murphy's curse law still applies? Things can't just work? Why is everything broken and just sitting there waiting for the Spartan to come fix it? Creativity, guys. Just put more thought into level design and stop reaching for the easy way out. 
Master Chief is a soldier, not a glorified repairman or sci-fi MacGyver. Welcome aboard the UNSC Infinity. I'm Spartan Sarah Palmer, Infinity Commander. The multiplayer is pretty solid with your regular deathmatch, team deathmatch, capture the flag experiences, and even a mode that allows you to play as a flood against the Spartans. There's also Spartan Ops, which allows you to play a storyline in co-op mode or single player. Now the leveling up system can seem a bit unbalanced for a newcomer though. More seasoned players have a significant advantage to the person entering at level 1. It's not like in Call of Duty where a bullet is a bullet and the only advantage you have over a new player or say guns and perks. No, it's a whole lot more complicated. Check out episodes of the lobby to learn more. In Halo, like most of these popular first person shooters, you have no cover system. Yes, I agree. You have these added perks that allow you to carry these little helpers like a turret and a force shield other than the one that you're already equipped with at the start but that's still no cover system and the foolish thing about this extra shield you have you see you can't shoot while using it you can't reload while using it and your shield can't recharge while it's up now as dumb as some of these cockroaches are that you're fighting against some of them have a shield and they can shoot while it's up but no not the wise and powerful master chief So no real cover system, and then with all the extra bells and whistles Master Chief has, all the extra Spartan training from birth, this powerful suit that puts Batman's utility belt to shame, this man cannot run and reload or shoot. That's right, decades of military training and this man cannot figure out and appreciate the use of run and gun. Any one of you watching this review could hold a gun, run with it and shoot at the same time. Maybe not accurately, but still with your life on the line and a hundred angry bugs trying to kill you, my advice would be, give it a shot. Saving seems to be a bit tricky in Halo 4. A checkpoint is apparently not a save point unless you choose to save and quit after the checkpoint then start again. I found this out the hard way. After passing through many checkpoints, I turned the power off and expected to pick up where I left off, only to find myself back at the beginning of the stage. Now, I still find this nonsense hard to believe, so if any gamer watching knows otherwise, please feel free to let me know. That's the email address at the bottom of the screen. But that's how it went down with me. What were those things? Similar to Hitman Absolution, at the beginning of a new stage your weapons are reset to default. Not cool. First up, as bad as I said the weapons are in Halo, your default weapons are by far the worst. I mean yeah, the Magnum packs some power and accuracy but has very limited ammo. And it also has a scope, it's kinda funny that the Magnum has a scope but your rifle doesn't have a scope. So I'd much rather know that I worked real hard a stage before, got two guns that worked best for me, and was able to carry them over into the next stage. But again, no, 343 apparently likes the player to suffer. Yes, this review seems pretty harsh for a game so widely loved by the gaming community, Xbox fanboys especially, but I'm not a drone or a clone and I'm not on Microsoft's payroll. So while Halo 4 does what it does well, being the game that it is and it looks great, in my opinion certain things could have been pushed up. I'm not saying the devs should have completely overhauled the game to make it feel like a Call of Duty or even a Killzone, but those games came closer to what in my opinion is user friendly. Certain aspects of Halo 4 seems old and dated. Like this stuff was absolutely mind blowing when the first Halo came out. But come on guys, don't let your pride or ego stop you from making well needed fine tuning to your product. Don't say like, no, I'll never add a cover system to Halo, I'm not trying to be like Rainbow Six. Ego trips like that just end up shortchanging gamers like myself. A lot of other gamers might not notice a need for these things now, but the day Call of Duty or Halo gets a well executed cover system or the ability to run and shoot, these same gamers will be like wow what a great addition I no longer get shot in a team deathmatch because I was running around a corner. Some people never see the need for something until they get it. That's why consumers are so easily wowed by simple crap. Me, I have foresight. I didn't need to see the Wii to know motion controls were a good idea. Motion controls have been about since the Super Nintendo and the Genesis. Who's ever seen this controller? That's right, it just wasn't brought to the forefront or done right, but that doesn't mean people didn't have the foresight to see the need for it. Anyway, with all that said, the lab gives Halo 4 a 7 out of 10. Sorry fanboys, good game, but still not great. You're bending history for your own favor and you know it.
stick around, we check out a PS4 launch title. We also have a lot to talk about in the lobby and a bit more. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, with its release date pushed back a bit, we take a look at one of the most highly anticipated games of 2013, The Last of Us. We also look at some of the gameplay footage from the recently announced Killzone Shadowfall for the Sony PS4. Let's check it out. I need something smuggled out of the city. Just cargo, Joel. I just want some simple gear enough to set me on my way. From developers Naughty Dog and publishers Sony, just about every PS3 owner is eagerly anticipating the release of The Last of Us. Set for release on June 14th, this summer is looking real promising. We expect nothing but the best from the guys who brought us the Uncharted series. Killzone Shadowfall, a launch title for the PS4. Even though I'm not your biggest Killzone fan, I have to say this looks pretty good. And the best thing is, this is just a launch title, and as any gamer knows, you never really see the true power of a system at launch. I mean, look at some of the 360's launch titles. Like this one, Perfect Dark Zero. Now compare this to a title like Halo 4 or Black Ops 2. Get it? Nice. If this is what a PS4 launch title looks like, imagine what we'll be playing on our PS4s three years from now. You know, you always hear that communication is key, and it's even more so online. Now what we have here is the Air Force PDT. This is for your PlayStation 3. Great while playing online, some good multiplayer action, you can talk with your friends. Now, in the lobby today, we revisit some Warfighter. That's right, Medal of Honor Warfighter. Now the Jamaican Warfighter nation actually needs our support, so join in guys. You play Medal of Honor online, then become a part of the movement. We also look at some Dead or Alive 5. A lot of action in the lobby today. Let's check it out. In Medal of Honor Warfighter, there is a new map called Zero Dark Thirty. They also revamped the multiplayer interface. If you happen to play Warfighter online, then go over to Warfighter Nations. Register your squad to help build the Jamaican Warfighter Nation. Yes, there is an actual Jamaican Warfighter Nation, and they need our support, so chip in. I have yet to see a real hardcore mode in Warfighter though, as the real ops mode is a bit of a letdown. I need to see a hardcore mode where one shot can kill, not just a headshot either. That's why I always give it up for Call of Duty and their hardcore mode. One shot will kill, even if it's in the leg. And reloading is still a pain. Now, in Dead or Alive 5, we have a pretty decent multiplayer setup here. Other than the things we're used to, like creating lobbies and playing ranked and unranked matches, we also have the options of keeping tabs on players we meet online with a thing called a Fighters List. This is good if you meet players that you're able to create a good fighting chemistry with, which is hard to find in the multiplayer world regardless of the genre. You have to keep them on the list without even adding them to your friends list. A really cool addition. Fighting in general in Dead or Alive is as fun as it has always been. There, there is some room for improvement in the overall game, but I might do a review on it one day and give you the 411. Well that's it for the lobby today and as usual, thanks for playing. On the next episode of The Lab, we'll review Sleeping Dogs and Far Cry 3, plus some Halo 4 multiplayer. Now, a special thanks to Straight Games in the Sovereign Center and you are valuable gamers for watching. Until we meet again, you can find us online at fabricatedprojects.com. Email your comments to the lab video game TV at yahoo.com. You can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Remember, our game is never over. <laughs>